Well, good morning, saints. We're back with Apostle of the Future. And I want to tell you what, it is time. Hold on. Let me actually make sure. I'm sorry. I want to make sure one of my settings is right. We're going to talk today about judging. Oh, my. Oh, me. Oh, my. Uh, who am I to judge? Crimes against Christ. We're so busy defending people. Who is defending Jesus Christ? I have my gavel today. We might be gaveling. That's what kind of day it is since we're talking about judging. Who am I to judge? That's the question. Of course, you know, we got the whole Kirk Franklin thing with him cursing out his son and how his son made that public. Kirk has had some issues over the years. We're really not going to talk about Kirk Franklin uh, because that's not really the point of this moment. The point is how should Christians be reacting to this? What is the biblical response forget just the christian response because when we say christian response we're really talking about the church condition response but what does the word of god say tell your friends we are going to be talking about judging the j word uh, mm -hmm. i have plenty of water here good morning all good morning saints welcome to apostle of the future it's wednesday morning and i tell you what it's a dreary kind of day right now, spring, rain, but uh, it's fiery in the kingdom of God. What should our response be about judging? Should we judge? I mean, the word of God says judge not. And what's the difference between judging and holding somebody accountable? We have meshed a whole bunch of things into one. And so because we stand on judge not, who are you to judge? Now, nobody can say anything about anyone. That's really how it is now. If you bring up something, <coughs> who are you to judge? You're not perfect either. My favorite line, you're not perfect either. Isn't that fantastic? Like that's a standard of anything. Who are you? Well, I know that you have sinned too. So you're saying that you've never sinned and, and you're saying that you've never done whatever and, and you're saying, so you're perfect. So if I examine your life, then I'm going to find that there's no sin in your life. No, absolutely not. All have sinned. I mean, that's biblical. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us, there's none perfect. No, not one. The word of God lets us know over and over and over again, there was one perfect sacrifice and that was Jesus Christ. So if we are uh, born into sin, that means we're not perfect. So how is it that we can have sin, but not be able to judge so people can just do what they want and nobody can say anything? Then what's the point of salvation? I mean, you have to keep asking these questions to get to the root of our belief systems and actually do your homework to find out if what we believe and what we say is true is actually true. You can hear something preached so long that you just believe it's true. Good morning. Good morning. Whoops. What's happening here on my phone? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you all. Share, 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 share. Tag somebody on this issue about who am I to judge crimes against Christ? Because we really don't think about, we now we know about crimes against humanity, but we really don't think about crimes against Christ and who's going to defend the Lord. In, in all of these things where, let's just take what we have with Kirk or, or anybody else, when somebody is exposed for their mess that has been a long time messy issue, our response is almost never defending Christ. It's almost never defending the people who are on the receiving end of maybe somebody's abuse. It's almost so if, if this man, for example, cussed his, his, this his son is 33 years old, voicemail cursing him out. This kid probably grew up being cussed out by his dad. It's pretty safe to say he probably didn't start cursing him out last month. Probably not. We separate who people are in the kingdom from who they are, what they do, and then blame people who want to hold them accountable to a standard. We blame those people. And we say, well, because somebody said they're sorry, 
everything should be okay. Well, there's a difference between forgiveness and ignoring something. I can forgive somebody and still hold them accountable to their actions. You can. I, we, we have all offended somebody in our life. They have either forgiven us or not. And if they've forgiven us, I am still held accountable for my actions, even though the relationship can move forward. And so in the body of Christ, we are so out of whack when it comes to judgment because it makes no sense. If you are a parent and you have children, you love your kids, you discipline your children. Disciplining your children means you are issuing a judgment on their bad behavior. No, don't hit your sister. If that little kid says to you, who are you to judge me, mom, because you're not perfect? Do you, do you know what would happen in my house? I wouldn't be here today. I would not be here today. And if I was, I wouldn't have lips on my face. Okay, they'd be gone. Anybody who knows Miss Elaine knows we don't play that. So there are things in our household that we do that we do not do and enforce in the household of faith. In your own home, you good parents don't let their children do whatever they want to do. Good parents will groom them. They will train them. They will teach them, um, you know, spare the rod. OK, the rod is often should be like a last resort. But first we want to develop. We want to nurture. And then we want to see if the only way it's going to get that thing out of you is the rod. OK, <clears throat> but you have all these levels of discipline, which is a judgment against an action that you have deemed society has deemed the world has deemed the word of God has deemed as bad behavior. I'm just going to say bad behavior, meaning there is a negative application and a negative result of what you do. Lying is not good. So you, you can't, you would not not discipline your child for lying because you as a parent are not perfect. Although there are some parents who are like that. Well, I mean, how can I correct my kid? Because I mean, when I was their age, I no, no. The reason you correct your kid is because when you were their age, you did the same stupid thing and you know what happened in your life. And so we have taken this whole ball of Cupid love, secular love, demonic love, because you don't really hear demonic love, but there's demons behind what they call love. And we've wrapped it up and put the bow tie, love of Jesus on it. And so anytime somebody does something, they're busted, they're caught, they're exposed or whatever. And it doesn't have to be make national news. It could just be in your world. All of a sudden, nobody can judge. Now, where did that come from? Well, there are scriptures that talk about that. And guess what? I did my homework. We're going in. We're going in on judging. And what does the word of God really say? I did research. I looked up word origins and definitions because there were some things that I was a little bit confused on as far as what was Jesus saying here. It sounded like he was unsaying something over here. And anytime there's confusion in the word, I have to dig deep because mankind has interpreted and misinterpreted and change the words and change the applications of so many things, you have to dig down into the root. There are things that if, if I, uh, you know, a friend of mine, let's just say Prophet Norm is here. And uh, if, if she said, um, some, somebody said that, well, you know, I heard Prophet Norma said X, Y, and Z about you. Based on how I know her, I would say, no, that's either before I call somebody a flat out liar, Either you misheard, you maybe caught a piece of something. Was she telling a story? Uh, what, what, what was the context? You can walk in in the middle of something and think you heard the right thing. And they're off talking about something completely different. And so we've done that with the word of God. You can just do a comparison, pick like five scripture verses and pick five different translations of the Bible. And you will get five different conclusions. And so I went, uh, Esword is another wonderful resource to have on your desktop. <clears throat> eSword. I think it's eSword.org. You can go to eSword, E-S-W-O-R-D.org, I think, and you can download it for free. And it has the Greek and Hebrew where you can click and see what is the original word that was used here. That's what I did on this subject because I thought you can't talk about, and we're going to talk about the wages of sin is death, 
Now, over in, in all these scriptures, I mean all these scriptures around these, talks about consequences. Consequences are judgments. And but in these, it's saying not to do that. And 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 then I'm thinking, I have heard something a certain way so long. Did I actually miss what scripture was saying? Oh, we are going to talk about the plank in the eye, friends. We are going to talk about that scripture passage. I am super excited. So again, tell your friends, we're going to talk about who am I to judge crimes against Christ. We have preached an all-inclusive. We don't realize that we really do believe in inclusion, inclusionism a lot. We're going to say that we don't. No, I just believe that there's one way to Jesus. Do you? Do you? When it comes to these hairline, hair splitting, which we would call hair splitting, but to God, they're actually not hair splitting issues. When it comes to that, we have this gray area called my opinion, gray area called I'm not convicted, gray area called don't you judge me. So nobody's judging anybody. How is everything staying straight? Oh, it's not. That's right. That's why the church is a mess right now. We were in a meeting last night in Tulsa. Uh, General Flynn was in town. Amazing man of God. And he they, they throughout the night, they were talking about various things. Oh, I think I have to sneeze. And they were talking and said that how many churches are still closed? It came up. How many churches are still closed? Only having online church, doing whatever. Now, in Tulsa, uh, our mayor has issued, you know, some restrictions and whatnot. But according to the Constitution, churches have the right to gather. No matter what, we have a right to gather. There's no pandemic ex exception. And you know when the Constitution was wrote, written that diseases were taking people out all the time. I mean, they didn't have anything close to what we have as far as medicine. They were vulnerable to everything that was flying around. That wasn't in the Constitution then. And so, you know, it's not now. But that's a whole other subject. And so <clears throat> we're back judging. And so in, in looking through, I'm thinking so many churches are closed. Why? Because they shouldn't be open. They are not out for the Lord's interest. They're out for self. In so many things, I will say again, the last person to be defended is Jesus Christ. I want you to think about your own arguments. This is your own personal challenge for you uh, in your own time. How many times do you defend flesh before you defend Christ? How many times do you defend people before you defend the throne of God? Does it even cross your mind? There are television shows that I had to stop watching because I realized, man, this writing is amazing. It is phenomenal. The acting is fantastic and everything about this is against what jesus christ died for transgenderism homosexuality fornication adultery murder you can run it down in some of these shows as people's as christians and as ministers favorite shows because sometimes you're like it's just entertainment and sometimes really it is just entertainment Sometimes you you do you are you have to be exposed to what's out there. There are things that I will watch maybe a season of something or several episodes, especially if it's pertaining to something in my field. Uh, what's the demonic agenda? Like you do need to, as a Christian, as a minister, you need to know what are the prevailing plots. So I'm not talking about this whole convent kind of living where you don't. But when that becomes what you feast on that's when it becomes a problem. So I want to separate that and make a responsible statement here that it's not because we are watchmen on the wall. So we have to watch what's coming out. I, I've gone through seasons sometimes where I'm looking at these shows and the different types of witchcraft shows and ways that they're worming into our teenagers and adults and and the themes and what they're saying. So when I hear this being in, in prophets conversation, or our kids' conversation, I know where it's coming from and it can be dealt with in a host of ways. So there's that, being responsible, watching, seeing what's out there, uh, what's what's going on, what are these new apps, what's what's happened, uh, blah, da, 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 so on and so forth. And then you can recognize it. But when that becomes your diet, when that becomes your feast, 
when that becomes your spiritual nutrition, that's when you start having an issue. I knew, hey, this is a moment. Hey, since we're talking about transparency, this is a moment of truth. I knew when there were certain shows that I had to watch every week. And then God was like, do you understand? I hate everything about this show. Do you care that I hate everything about this show and you enjoy watching it? I'm going to hammer my own head. Flat line. Flat line. I was like, huh? Mm-hmm. This was about maybe seven years ago, six or seven years ago. He said, yeah, I hate this show. I hate everything about it. I hate the message. I, I hate the plot. I hate the plan. And I hate where it's going because, see, God knows where these things are going. He knows that they start out a little innocuous. Oh, just look at this fun little cast of characters doing. It's just these two little people having sex in the corner. Oh, you know, you can't. Well, every show has somebody who does that. And that's pretty much true. Okay, well, a little profane. Oh, there's one little gay character. Oh, and now the whole plot is about it. The whole plot. Now they're, oh, knocking the church and knocking God and Christians are suffocating. And, and here's where it ends up. How many of you have actually asked the Lord, do you have a problem with me engaging in X, Y, Z? Some people is drinking. Other people is cursing. Other people is sexing, sexting, texting. We don't even know what's swinging and everything else under the sun. How do you feel? See, again, Christ is the last person we ask. That's a problem, saints, because he's supposed to be my all in all. Oh, man, on Sunday, boy, we can hit it. Ah, And don't be a worship leader, man, because I know we can slay it on the stage and you can do it. And you can just, <laughs> oh, my God. And then who knows what? And so let's jump in the word. So I have here the little Petri dish because we are going to examine this. I mean, I could have had a gavel, but I have a gavel. Could have had so many things on here, <coughs> but I have this because we are going to examine and go in. Are you ready to go in on the subject? Let me sip my water. Here we go. We're going to go into the word and definitions because, well, without it, what are we doing? Let's start here. Let's just start right here. For the wages of sin. Let me make this bigger. Romans 623 for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. How many of us heard that growing up? It's a staple. At least it used to be a staple in the body of Christ. I'm not really sure what they're telling these kids today, but the wages of sin is death. Now, I actually did not have the opportunity to put this on a slide. What wages actually means? Because, again, we say that it's up to us. You cannot tell people that your forgiveness or absolution of their sin means God has done away with it. We're here in this hot mess right now because of that belief system. I need this to sink in. Is it sinking in? I need it to sink in. We cannot tell people that God doesn't have an issue with something if he says he has an issue with it. Again, I'm going to go back to raising children. It's like if you raise your kids, I don't have children, but hey, I have a brother. And so I was raised in a household. I, I know it's, it's hard to think that people who don't have kids were actually kids once. So we understand kids because we were one. <laughs> just saying. And so it's like in the household when a sibling tells another sibling, mom and dad won't be mad. Come on. It'll be fine. I'll tell him I told you to do it. Honey, they set you up straight up, straight up. Don't do it. Do not do it. And I'm a younger sibling. Older siblings will set yes, you will. straight up to get whooped, grounded, and then say, ha, 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 ha. And that's the devil. I'm telling you right now, that is the ne not in your siblings. That is how the devil does you. God won't mind. He won't care. He's a loving God. He's a forgiving God. You just go ahead and do it and then just say a prayer and it'll be okay. And then up jumps the Lord talking about, boom. I know that you... 
I know that devil told you that you could have sex with that person. And it'll be OK. But you have an STD for the rest of your life. So God forgave you. He forgave you. But your flesh will be afflicted all the days of your life. Got pregnant. Whoops. No, you will not have an abortion. You will have this baby. We're not going to have the twofold child of sin out of this. No, you will have a baby. You raise this child and you will do right after this. Because some people having that surprise pregnancy was the one thing that saved their life. Stop them from a train wreck. Stop them from sliding off the rails. So God will even allow your mistakes to save you from yourself. So Satan will whisper in your ear, it's okay. And now he'll use the pulpit. Preachers, God is a, he's a loving God. He's a, yes, he is. He's going to just forgive you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, your parents can be with you, never leave you nor forsake you and whoop you. Okay. Yes, they can. So we're talking about, wait, just wrong. Yes, Romans, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I looked up wage again. So wage the verb as in waging against or to is to give something as surety, deposit as a pledge. So we had the deposit, the pledge on sin to pledge, to pledge, guarantee, promise, bet, wager, pay to carry on, engage in. Now wage, the noun, is payment for services rendered, reward, just, okay, so we have reward, salary paid to a provider of service. <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna lean back because all of a sudden, these things have a very different application when you hear that the salary of sin is death. The payment of sin is death. The guarantee of sin is death. A pledge, I pledge to you <laughs> that your sin will equal death. That's what the word of God is talking about. James lets us know, yes, right, James, yes, lets us know that there is a payment on sin and it is death. It can be the death of a loved one. It can be the death of a vision, your vision. Whoops, wrong button there, sorry. It can be the death of your vision. It can be the death of your marriage. When sin enters in, something has to die. It can be your hope. It can be your dreams. It can be uh, any number of things, but when sin enters in, something has to die. That can take years and years and years and years to play out. For some people, they commit certain crimes against Christ that hit their children later in life, just like in, in everyday life. How many times have we seen, let's just take television, have we seen um, one person does something against somebody else? Let's say they have that street life. And then that person takes retaliation out on their family years later. And they'll say, yeah, but your dad took this from me and I'm going to take this from him. Yikes. So there's always a wage on sin. We have stopped teaching about wages of sin. We've stopped teaching about these things. And we tell people, hey, he's a loving God. He's an all forgiving God. It's going to be A-OK. -okay. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. Nowhere in scripture does it say that the love of God negates punishment for sin. Nowhere. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. The love of God, Jesus, Jesus came into the world because God so loved the world and to give us an option out of condemnation. We're already headed there. We're born into sin. That's the default destination setting on our souls unless we choose Jesus Christ. So you hear these messages, these people are all going clean off about Christians who wanted to hold Kirk Franklin and other people accountable. And at any time when we want to hold somebody who stands in a position of representing Jesus Christ accountable, we are the bad guy. Nobody said we didn't forgive Kirk Franklin for what he did, but you need to be accountable or whomever. Oh, that's right. He held himself accountable. Right. Sure. Because he was caught again. <laughs> okay. Kirk, Kirk's had some things going on in his life. And so we do not let people beat you down from holding a standard 
because you want answers. Nobody walks into the courthouse and tells the judge, you can't judge me because you're not perfect. You've, I'm sure you, uh, you know, broken the law somewhere too. And you know what? If that judge gets caught, they're going to court too. Who walks into the courtroom and says, excuse me, I think you have too much pride as a judge and I don't receive your judgment because you didn't issue it with humility. Let me sip my water. You can't go to your school teacher or the principal and say, when they tell you you have detention because you broke some rule and you say, I don't receive that because I know you're not perfect because you were five minutes late to work today. So you can't send me to detention because I saw you pull in the parking lot five minutes late. See how that works in your life. We, we do things that don't play out in our basic domestic environment. Moving on with scripture. Okay, so definition of a judge. A judge is a public officer, and I'll make this big, a public officer appointed to administer the law, one who declares the law, one qualified to pronounce opinion. So when we talk about, yes, but you are still going to jail, exactly. But when we talk about judging, what we don't talk about are the qualifications. So someone who was qualified to judge in general is the public officer you're appointed to administer the law. Let's bring this into the church context, shall we? Leaders, in theory, in the body of Christ, are appointed to administer the law and administrate to administer the law. Your church leaders, your governing officials, I know we don't like to use these words. Oh, aren't they just so painful, just so harsh? I don't think I like that word govern in when it comes to, to church. So what? It doesn't matter. We have made everybody's opinion carry equal weight in the body of Christ, and that's our problem. Nowhere in the word of God did it say when you get saved, you are elevated to the status of one who governs. No, that's why he talks about the children of God being sheep. You notice that all of the applications of what it means to be born again, except for we've been created. Okay, we're kings and priests. We have that. But then there's the sheep, the children the family okay one who declares the law one qualified to pronounce opinion that's a judge that's a judge you have to be qualified so whenever you're like you can't judge me you know what right because you're you actually your friend can't send you to jail you're going to jail says who says me anyway who are you you're my friend you're my sibling what what do siblings say to each other when mom and dad are not around but they left that one kid in charge you're not the boss of me. You're not the judge. And depending on your family structure, if your parents left them in charge and you didn't listen, you are going to be disciplined. Because they will say, we left your brother or sister in charge. Why are you being disobedient? You're grounded. All right. So we have that. Now, to judge. So the other was the noun, a judge. This is the verb to judge. To judge something is to examine, appraise, or make a diagnosis. To form an opinion about, inflict penalty upon, punish, try someone and pronounce sentence, make a decision, decide, think, suppose, to judge, pronounce judgment, pass an opinion on. Look at that slide. Look at those words. I need somebody to tell me how we get offended by this definition. Judging is making an opinion. I made a judgment call this morning. I decided to wear a pink jacket and pink lipstick to match and not wear pink eyeshadow. I made a judgment call, a decision. I, I cast an opinion on what shoes I was going to wear. I made, a, I made a, a decision on what today's broadcast was going to be about. In essence, a judgment is a decision. We say judge and hear condemn. You can't judge me 
Well, what you're are you saying I can't condemn you, or are you saying I can't have an assessment? I can't have a, a conclusion. We make judgments all the time. Where do you want to go for lunch? Oh, I don't know. I can't make a decision. I can't make a decision. I can't decide. That means I can't make a judgment call. You decide. You judge. You determine. Where should we go for lunch? So we believe in judging. We we you cannot get out when your alarm goes off. Your first judgment of the day is: Am I getting up on time or not? Judgment number one: Am I getting up on time or not? You've made a judgment before your eyes are fully open. You made a judgment before that. Are you happy to be awake or are you upset? You have already judged some people what kind of day they're going to have by how they wake up in the morning. Isn't that interesting? So we judge constantly. In fact, whenever people surround themselves with bad friends, we say you're a poor judge of character. If somebody spends their money recklessly, we say they're not good with money. That's a judgment. Who are you to say I'm not good with money? You waste it. Who are you to, who are you? I don't, I don't appreciate that word waste and on and on it goes. So again, the, what we say we believe in the body of Christ doesn't hold water in the rest of the world. <clears throat> now getting down to the scripture, what does the word of God really say? And how did we get here? Because That's what I want to know. Okay. Matthew 7, 1. Is it here? Here we go. Judge not. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, we're going to pause right there. Okay, so that's the scripture. And here is in um, Esword, I clicked on the word judge. And it tells you that it's number G2919, Crino. And it means properly to distinguish, that is decide mentally or judicially by implication to try, condemn, punish, avenge, conclude, condemn, damn, decree, determine, esteem, judge, go to, sue at the law, ordain, call in question, sentence to, think. So these are the various things honing in on condemning and avenging and punishing. These scriptures are really honing in on punishing and condemning and avenging, okay? As far as what we are and are not supposed to do. So when we go back up to the passage, whoops, here we go. So when we say condemn not, avenge not, that you be not avenged or judged, for with that same judgment you condemn, you will be condemned. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So this is letting you know that you can judge in the measure in which you judge, judge or condemn, it will come back to you. So what does that mean? That means that if you're somebody who comes to a conclusion harshly, you don't care about the truth. Guess what? That's going to be meted back to you. You notice that if you're somebody who is very cold and very callous with other people, other people are cold and callous to you. Do you notice that if you're somebody who shows mercy, people tend to be merciful to you and they don't know why, even when they want to hammer you down, they'll say, OK, you have one more try. I was pulled over once by a police officer. I was speeding. I didn't realize I was speeding in the zone. And he said, you didn't see me behind you? And I said, no, I didn't. He said, I was flashing my light on the side. I said, complete. When I tell you, I didn't even notice it. It was at night too. And I don't know. I must remind you this guy of his daughter or something. Cause he was actually very kind. And he says, put your hand out this window. And so I put my hand out the window and he goes one finger and he, he said, there's your slap on the wrist. <laughs> he says, just pay attention young lady. And I said, okay. And I was in my big old truck at the time. I think he was really entertained at the fact that I was in that big truck because I try to extend mercy. I had, I knew somebody else in that exact same season, no mercy with the police whatsoever, none. Uh, and, and so the measure, how you judge other people is how you will be judged. This is what this passage is talking about, how you condemn, how you avenge, 
how you do those things. Now, here's the other part. And this is, uh, man, do we get this wrong? Verse three, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Now we stop right there, don't we? We stop right there. And we're like, see, that's what I'm talking about because you can't talk about the plank in my eye. You have a speck in your eye or a speck in my eye. You have a plank in your eye. And the word of God says that you can't address somebody else's mess because you have mess too. Is that all it says? No, it says hypocrite. First, everybody say first, first, remove the plank from your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The word of God never says to ignore somebody else's mess because you have more mess. It actually doesn't say that. What it says is get your act together and then you can help somebody else. So if your act is together, then you can go and say, hey, hey, man, you have this little, hey, let's, we need to have some deliverance. We need to have some prayer. So the word, we preach it. Don't we preach it? We teach it that it says you can't say anything to anybody else because the word of God says so. Actually, the word of God says that how you do other people is how it will be done to you. Golden rule all over again. And then you can't help somebody else until you first take care of yourself and then you'll be able to help somebody else. So this passage does not say you, because you have something in your eye, because you have sin, you can't help anybody else out of theirs. What it's saying is you need to clean yourself up and then go help them. First get right and then go help other people. This can be tied to Jesus with Peter when he was telling him that Satan was desiring him to sift him as wheat and that he was praying that his faith would fail not. And when you are converted, go strengthen your brethren. It's the same line of thinking because it's Jesus. He's consistent everywhere. So he's telling Peter as an apostle who is going to be the rock, the foundation, uh, the cornerstone, all this kind of, well, Jesus is cornerstone, but the rock in which he builds his church you must first be converted and then you can go strengthen others. And here he is saying in scripture, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye, which means that you can go after the wrong thing because of the sin that's in you. You're not seeing clearly. You're not thinking clearly. How many of us can say that after we've come through deliverance, the world just looks so much different. You're like, oh, wow. And deliverance, you, you your vision can be blurred because of envy. It can be blurred because of unforgiveness. That plank in your eye can be unforgiveness. You can't help anybody else out of their stuff because you have so much unforgiveness in your heart. It can be brokenness. It can be jealousy. It can be rivalry. It can be all of these ugly little things that will take you out. It can be disobedience. Mm. Bless the Lord. And the list goes on. Isn't that something? I'd love to hear your feedback on that. James, we're going to conclude with this. James 4, 11 through 12 is talking about speaking evil. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So this is the same judge that is used because that judge is used, I think, like 114 times in the King James Version of the Bible. And so it's still the same application. Do not speak evil of one another. It's very important that we hone in on that because that is the context in which everything else is hinging. The danger, dangerous places we get in the body of Christ, we just extrapolate scripture, we lift it out, we cut and paste it together, and then we beat people upside the head with it, or we exonerate them from things that God did not exonerate. Okay. Hey, Thomas Jarber, what's up, Elder? Thanks for tuning in today. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Look, I'm looking over at my phone here. Oh, so how 
do we deal with this issue about speaking evil man oh man and let me tell you what social media people are speaking evil post 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 left and right and so now speaking evil judging plank spec these are all different things we have distilled the word of god down to the simplest lowest common denominator this is why people are confused they are confused because we have slapped a single application on like six or seven different terms and said this is all love this is all forgiveness this is all judgment no that's why the law is huge in our own country thoughts and intent actually determine what level of sentencing you can get in court if the judge or the jury deems that you intended to do something versus it was an accident, two different degrees of crime, different uh, penalties, different options. And see, in the word of God, it's pretty much the same thing. Thought and intent, huge, huge factor. And what happens to you? Did you meditate on that? Was it something spontaneous? Was it a reaction? Were you somewhere you should not have been? On and on and on. Okay. And so here it says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. What does evil mean? We're going to go to this. Uh, well, I think this might be the last slide. One of them. Okay. So speaking evil is G2635. And I'm um, sorry, it's G2637. Sorry. 37 is the accurate number there. To be a traducer. That is to slander, speak against evil of. Now, I looked up traduce because I had no idea what it meant. Traduce means to expose to shame or blame by means of falsehood and misrepresentation. To violate, betray, traduce a principle of law. Oh, wow. This adds so much clarity to this passage. So when we see here. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. Do not slander. Do not expose to shame or blame by means of falsehood and misrepresentation. Do not violate. Do not betray a principle of law. All right. Do not do that. So he who speaks evil of a brother, he who does those things, and then you judge. See, this is talking about that unrighteous judgment. So you've spoken evil and then you judge evil. Now, isn't that different from just saying what you did was wrong? This is talking about you are putting somebody out there as evil. We say that putting their name out there is evil, meaning you are slandering, you're misrepresenting, there's a falsehood involved, and then you're judging them. You are. <clears throat> That's what this scripture is talking about. Okay, but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? So this is talking about that evil judgment that we do, people. Can we have real talk for just a minute here? Real talk. Yes, Daniel, Twitter is a dumpster fire. <laughs> that is the truth. That is the truth. And so this is real talk. Real talk is you can put somebody's name out there as evil because you don't like them. They did something you didn't do. They got a position you wanted. Doesn't have to be uh, some sort of murder. It doesn't have to be all these other things. I mean, you can murder somebody's reputation. You can. I, I'm sure I know I've been on the receiving end of that. We all have at some point where you find out that so and so was saying this about you. And you're like, huh? Where did that even come from? Maybe you do know where it came from. And eh, sipping water. Mm -hmm. And so if this is about not speaking evil against one another. So to recap here, we can see. Let me see here. Where am I with my slides? Okay, that's the end. So we can go back up to this. The wages of sin is death. It doesn't matter how we misconstrue the word. It doesn't matter how we twist it and mangle it, how good we want people to feel. This is what the Lord said. I mean, 
Parents cannot stand it when they send their children somewhere else and those people have zero regard for their standards for their kids. I don't want my kids having sugar after this time or at all. I don't want them watching these types of television shows. How many parents and the grandparents, the grandparents don't care. Yeah, but these are just my grandkids. And they're like, I'm raising these children with the same principles you raised us with quite harshly sometimes. And now that it's your grandkids, you're throwing my principles out of the window. Parents can't stand sending their kids places that disregard their rules for their children. But that's what we do in churches now. We will tell people it, it's fine. But the Bible says it's fine. The love of God will. It's OK. People's lives are in all kinds of judgment, all kinds of punishment, all kinds of of issues going on because the leaders in the house of God have told them, God doesn't mind. That's fine. He understands. He understands you're just flesh. He understands. Uh -huh. He does understand that you're just flesh. I mean, he made it and then he cursed it and he brought it down and then he sent Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that the punishment isn't going to hit you for being human. But Lord, I just don't even understand how that happens. Well, you know, it's you're just human. <laughs> it's just the response that hits humanity. But I, I, I prayed and I asked God for forgiveness and he did forgive. But forgiveness is not an absolution of punishment. And we think that one equals the other. We have seen it in the court of law. Somebody will murder somebody else's child. The parents will have this very emotional moment of forgiveness with the person who did it. And the judge still sends them to jail. It's such a touching moment. Wow. Uh, I'm just so touched and blessed and ministered to by this family, forgiving the person who killed their son. They're still going to jail because there might be something that judge saw in that person to let him know they're going to do it again if I let him out. And then you have other times where there's leniency, there's exceptions. Somebody's praying in the background. The Lord knows you got caught up in mess, whatever. And then there, there is, there's mercy. There's grace granted there. There's like, okay, let me do this one more time. Let's give you one more chance to, but see, that's up to God to decide. That's not up to us. That's up to the Lord. It's like parents, you have that kid. I don't know how many parents I have seen there. They are just having to correct their kids and fight laughing at the same time because the whole moment is funny because the kids are just having a moment and you have to have the poker face, but you walk out and you're like, that is so funny. They're so dramatic. But you know, if you cave in that moment, that kid's going to know they got you. And then they're going to turn it into a point of manipulation over and over and over and over. Now, it's one thing to manipulate mom and dad in the house. But when you get out in the world and your manipulation can cost you a whole lot more than it does with mom and dad. So strong parents hold that face. Sorry, you're grounded. They do whatever. They go in their room and they fall out laughing. <laughs> or they laugh later and they're like, man, it took everything I had not to crack up at them because they were so there. Blah, blah, blah. But see, that's up to the parents to decide. And we have taken the role of God in his church and told them, told people what's OK and what's not OK. And he's like, that's not OK. That is not OK. So who am I to judge crimes against Christ? I'm going to go back to the statement I made in the beginning, especially if you came in late to the people in the back. If you came in late. Jesus is typically the last person we defend, if at all. We will measure our responses based on people, not on God. As an apostle, if you're an apostle, if you're an apostle in training, if you're a prophet, prophet in training, prophetic, if you're a leader, you have got to understand there are times that God will make you come down with a heavy hand because he knows that that action there might be one thing to you, but it's tied to all of these other things that you have never seen. I've been in adult ministry for 21 years, and I have seen the Lord have some very interesting reactions on things that we did not want to be that harsh about, but he knows what's going on behind the scenes. 
He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that scripture, we use it as a security blanket. Sucking thumb. Oh, it makes me feel good. That means he's with everybody all the time. So when he says, I need you to lay the gavel down on this situation and you just want to give a slap on the wrist, you need to trust that he knows why he's saying gavel, not warning. Sentence, not exoneration. You're going to jail. You're being stripped of your title. You're being removed from your position. You're doing whatever. And you do not want to count God unjust through his leaders, because sometimes we'll never say, well, I mean, I didn't say that God wasn't unjust. I just didn't like the decision his leader made. Mm -hmm. If you are an apostle, if you are a prophet, you have got to make it your business to never give the impression that God is okay with something that he is not okay because you want to be okay with it. I can't tell you how many times over the years that we have uh, wrestled with a decision. Don't want to do it. I don't want to say it. I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to be the heavy. And God is like, are you going to do what I told you to do or not? Yes. <laughs> sure. And it goes down the way he wants it to go down. And then later on, you find out all kinds of things you didn't know because there are times he doesn't want people to touch his people. We don't think about that. Again, using the, the parenting example, you don't let just anybody watch your kids. You have family members that you don't let watch your kids. Some of you, your own parents don't watch your children. No, no, no. We go over and visit and they come home with me. They might not be saved. They might curse and you don't curse. They might drink and you don't drink. They might have associates or friends that you don't like. You're like, no, I'm just, no, no, we're just going to visit and come on. There are all kinds of reasons that you are protective over your children. You don't let just anybody in your house. You don't let them when they come in your house to do anything they want to do. So they feel more comfortable than you. But when it comes to the house of the Lord, we really want to give the impression that, hey, it's a free for all. As long as you feel okay, Jesus feels okay. Don't we say that? So don't judge anybody because they're not going to feel okay. Yeah, right. Judge them. I mean, coming up, almost nobody came over to my house because my mom was like, no. Uh -uh. Plus, we had very long work weeks. And by the time we got to the weekend, it was like chill out, fall out and roll out and do it all over again. But we have got to take a stand for Jesus Christ and not just ourselves, because we're always looking out for number one, aren't we? We're always looking out for us. We're looking out for our, our money. We're looking out for this. We're looking out for that. But who's looking out for Jesus? We've gone through things in our organization over the years. And I'll tell you what, I've seen Dr. Price take a beating on some decisions that she's made in the name of the Lord. And what's very frustrating is when I hear all the arguments that disagree with what she did, none of them were about what God said or what he wanted. None from other leaders and ministers. But what did God say? And you know what? When you ask people, what did God say? They freeze. Well, I mean, I didn't ask the Lord. This is my opinion. This is my supposition. This is my conclusion. What did God say? Because if we're talking to the same God, He's going to say the same thing to you that he said to me. And we will be on the same page, even if it's an uncomfortable page. <laughs> it might be an uncomfortable page. You want to give, there was a giving information for you. I tell you what, let's see here. Anything else I need to see? Oh yeah. How about this? If you need prophetic or apostolic advisement, you can visit www.propheticed.com and schedule a discovery call with me. Go ahead to propheticed.com. If you want me to be your advisor, your coach, your prophetic intelligence person, apostolic wisdom, then you can sign up. Uh, it can be maybe a one-time deal, 30 minutes. I think it was a 15 or 30 minute prophetic advisement, or you can sign up for regular coaching subscription every month. It is not free. OK, I got to pay bills, people. I do not understand how people think you can serve the Lord and not get a paycheck and still make your life work. How is that going to happen? God will provide how. 
I'm in Tulsa. I don't see a lot of ravens flying around, dropping off food and bread and water. How? My car, the people holding the loan, don't take favor. They take money. All right? They don't, our landlords don't take prayer. They take money in the bank. So please don't be that person with me, okay? Because it'll be a conversation that we'll never have again. So again, if you need that advisement, if you need that counsel, go ahead and and uh, go to prophetic, uh, yeah, prophetic-ed.com and schedule a discovery call with me. One-time deal or as you need it or anything else. Let's see. <clears throat> Excellent. Who's looking out for Jesus? Yes, Lord. Who? 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 Who will go for us? All right. Let me see. What is this comment saying? My cosmetics. Oh, my cosmetics site. Yes, I do have that. Ashley C. Cosmetics. It is in a revamp phase. You can still order it. I'm getting some things set up behind the scenes. That's why I have not been marketing it right now because we are in a branding overhaul and uh, setting some things up, but you can still place your orders and get products. So you can do that. AshleyCCosmetics.com. All right, saints. It's been a day. It's been a day. It's been a time. Thanks for tuning in to Apostle of the Future. I tell you what, um, we have a lot to deal with. We have a lot to deal with in the body of Christ, a lot to deal with in our own personal homes, or our own personal addresses. Let's get it right for the Lord in this era. Let's think about him first and not just our own personal preferences, okay? God bless you all. I'll see you next week on Apostle of the Future. You know I almost said in the midnight hour. That too.